Namaste. And welcome to the next episode of Yoga Vasishta. We're going to continue with chapter 25, The Dance of Death. Death dances about in the form of the five-headed Hara, Shiva the Destroyer, with the loosened braids of hair upon him, while destiny in the form of Gauri, Shiva's consort, her locks adorned with mandara flowers, keeps her pace with him. In her war dance, destiny bears a large gourd representing her big belly, and her body is adorned with hundreds of hollow human skulls jingling like the alms pots of coupley mendicants. She has filled the sky with the emaciated skeleton of her body and her terrible destructive figure. The various shapes of skulls of the dead adorn her body like a beautiful garland of lotuses. They sway to and fro during her dance at the end of a kalpa, age. So this is very graphic and wonderful description of the dance of death. That this cosmic manifestation is only temporary and at the end it will be destroyed, at the end of the Mahakalpa, the great age. Everything will be wiped out. And then after a rest, it will be recreated again. And the same play, the same <laughs> drama will be enacted. The same people will be born, live and die again, and again and again and again. And this is the real history of the world. This is the real cycle of creation. Creation, maintenance, and destruction. Again and again, without end. Well, why does this happen? Well, if you consider God as like a fire, just by its nature, it creates many flames and sparks. And these are the creations. Huh? The fire remains, but the flames and sparks come and go. And as they get farther away from the fire itself, they gradually fade out and disappear. So the creation is naturally an emanation from the Supreme, just like the flames of a fire. And the living beings are just like the sparks. And the farther they get away from their source, they cool out and die. So this is going on just like yang and yin. Huh? That God is yang. He is the light force. And from him, everything emanates. By him, everything is created. But these creations are simply illusory. They're temporary. And as they get farther away from their source, they flicker out and disappear. That is simply the nature of creation. The source remains, but that which is created is simply temporary. That is the nature of it. So then one might ask, well, what is the cure for this? What, what is the medicine that can heal this process of death? And that is yoga. In yoga, one comes into contact with the actual source, the creator, the eternal fire, uh, the spiritual sun that emanates everything. And instead of flying away from the source and dying, one enters the source and gains eternal life. The horrible roaring of the giddy clouds, Pushkar and Avarta, at the end of the Kalpa serves to represent the beating of her Damaru drum. As death dances along, the moon appears like his earring, 
and the moonbeams and stars appear like his crest of peacock feathers. The snow-capped Himalayas appear like a crown of bones in the upper loop of his right ear, and Mount Meru as a golden ring in his left. Under their lobes are suspended the moon and the sun, like pendant earrings glittering over his cheeks. The mountain ranges called the Lokaloka are fastened like chains around his waist. Lightning bolts are the bracelets and armlets of destiny, which move to and fro as she dances along. The clouds are her dressing gown that fly about her in the air. So these are cosmic forces. Huh? They're described here as persons because the cosmos is alive. It has its own intelligence. It's not simply a dumb clockwork machine wound up at the creation and let go to gradually wind down. No, it's, it's an intelligent living being. Yin and yang, the creator and the creation, the source and the emanation are here pictured as Ishwara and destiny. And their dance at the end of the cosmic creation causes its dissolution and disappearance. So who can resist them? The scale of their dance, the nature of their courtship, huh? and the, uh, the forces at work here are simply irresistible. They're huge, they're unimaginably powerful. So nothing can withstand them, not even the fabric of space and time itself. They're all ripped to shreds at the end of the creation and then created anew out of nothing. This is the power of God. Now the power of God is also in us but we don't realize that because we are identified with this temporary body. We are illusioned by this deluded mind that sees everything temporary as real, that sees even imaginary things like names and abstractions like groups and classes of things like animals or nations as real and tangible. This, is, this has always amazed me about the human condition, that simply by believing in a name, people think that it's actually real. And they'll even fight for it and die for it, sacrifice for it, and so on. It's just amazing to me. So then what is real? What is real is that which is eternal. What is real is that which is never born and thus never dies. That which never comes into manifestation and therefore never has to be destroyed or disappear. That is only God. And God, although he manifests his powers as persons, as demigods. God is ultimately not a person because a person would be a limit. A person would be an identification. A person would be a name and form. And God has no name or form. That which is beyond time is only eternity. And eternity has no qualities, no dimension, no name or form, as I mentioned, no personality, no identity. Huh? But he is pure consciousness. So by this process of yoga, we learn and experience directly that we are nothing but consciousness. 
Mundane enjoyments are no other than long ropes dropped down by the hand of death that keep all mankind bound fast to the world. The great vortices of social customs, the successions of joy and grief, the excess of pride and the darkness of passions form the streaks of hair on his body. After the end of the world, he ceases to dance and creates anew all things from the lowest animal that lives in the earth to the highest Brahma and Shiva. By turns, destiny as an actress acts her parts of creation and destruction, diversified by scenes of old age, sorrow, and misery. Time repeatedly creates the worlds with the different abodes and localities teeming with population. He forms the movable and immovable substances, establishes social customs, and again dissolves them, as children make their dolls of clay and break them soon afterwards. So the things that we think are enjoyable are actually the bindings that keep us in this world of birth and death. And by pursuing them, we go deep into illusory consciousness. Huh? He mentions here the vortices of social customs. A vortice is a whirlpool, a vortex. Huh? And like we've mentioned before, a vortex creates fake matter. And that is how the social customs that we think are real and tangible are actually only illusions. And the fact that they change in different parts of the world and at different times should tell us that these are only illusions. They're only temporary conventions like language. Language in one part of the world is different from language in a different part. Huh? And what is moral in one country is immoral in another. So what are these social conventions? Huh? The things that you have to say and the things that you can't say. The things that you must do and what you must not do. <laughs> these are all simply inventions, fabrications, very, very intangible things. And they are soon destroyed and replaced by others. So what is the meaning of them? Huh? Wise men know that these are all artificial. So they don't put much stock in them. They sit alone and watch the world go by, huh? like the fool on the hill. <laughs> He's not a fool at all. He's simply detached. He is not participating in the illusion, but simply watching it as an observer might watch a movie or a play. Because he knows these things are changeable and temporary, and soon they'll be destroyed and replaced by others. So there's no need to get all involved in them. There's no need to consider them very important. So destiny is an illusion, like a dancer, like an actress who plays a part. Huh? At the end of the play, she takes off her costume and goes home to her real life. So during the creation, the maintenance and destruction of the material world, destiny appears as a cruel mistress. But what is she really? She's the loving wife of God, of time. So because of this, she has to act in a certain way, but that's not her real nature. The yogi gets to know the real nature of destiny because actual destiny means union with God. And that is the purpose of Yoga Vasishta. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om. 
கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் கீதா